Hello, community. You know, we distilled here LLM's vision language model, vision language action model. And today, today we have a brand new research by Harvard University, MIT, and Carnegie Mellon University. And they tell us, you know what? Now we are distilling agents because we want to make agents smaller that they can be put on edge devices. And in plus, hey, maybe they are cheaper. So, Let's have a look at the latest research. And here we have it. Carnegie Mellon University, Northeastern University, Harvard University, MIT, Peking University, University of Georgia. And what? Florida has an international university. My goodness. And they say, hey, structured agent distillation for LLMs. So what is it? Now, it's a new framework that compresses now our LLM-based agents. You know, the LLM is the intelligence core in each and every agent into a smaller model. And here they go with a smaller student model. So you know exactly we are in imitation learning. We have a teacher-student distillation. Now, the interesting thing is they say, hey, we want to preserve here the reasoning fidelity and the action consistency. And you know what? It turns out that this is exactly what is the problem up until now. So what they do is, hey, we can segment here our trajectory into the reasoning trajectory and into the action trajectory. And then they apply segment-specific loss function for the training. And you might say, hey, wait a minute. In the video here of yesterday, well, it's today here recording this video. It's not released. You see, it's still private. We were talking here because of the specific here of a new form of GRPO, we were talking about a decoupled group relative policy optimization. And we also talked about here a control token and a response, if you want, loss function. So different loss function here also here for the adaptive reasoning. We looked at adapt think and think less. And you might say, is this the same? Yeah, have a look. If you look here at the paper, think less. You remember we had a short token and then we had here the sync token. So to distinguish between the two short syncing and the long syncing, long arguing mode. Because we had an instability in the system, the authors had to not to go just with the plain vanilla GRPO, but they had to go with the D GRPO. Plus we had some hyperparameters. And you know what? We are doing now the same because... And here is now the paper you should be aware of. University of Cambridge, University of Edinburgh, cross tokenizer distillation via approximate likelihood matching. Because they tell us here that most approaches rely here on token level supervision, which treats here the complete agent trajectory as a flat token sequence and aligns here the prediction step by step, ignoring simply here the structured composition of freezing and action. Now, guess what they did now? They said, okay, if the token level distillation here and the classical thing fails, so lack here the structural awareness, in practice, trajectory often have an alternate between the internal reasoning step and the external action sequences. Now what they do? They separate it. Well, what a coincidence. So what we have, and the new methodology by Harvard and MIT and CMU is now called SAD. And it's such a sad word, but it's unfortunately also a sad paper. Because what they did is just what, here the paper here from the last days, what they did also here, our friends in China and the friends in Singapore. And now we see the same thing emerging here at Harvard and MIT. So, congratulations. So we do have here the structured agent distillation, which is sad which segments now the trajectories into two spans. And we have, what a surprise, the reasoning span and the action span. So we apply now a span-specific supervision to improve here the structural imitation learning. And guess what? Because we know that in this learning process, if we have a curriculum mechanism, so if we start with a very simple level of complexity and we continuously increase the complexity, our and performance of the system will gonna be much, much better. So this is also what we integrate by ordering out a training example by their complexity. This is it. I mean, this is it. The teacher agent, yes, has an initial observation and a sample task, produces here the reasoning trajectory, 
and the corresponding action trajectory. You see this here and here, beautiful. So we have now with some token, the reason and the action components are extracted here into a trajectory for the curriculum sampling. And the student agent now, since we have imitation learning, learns now here two objectives. The chain of thought policy alignment loss and the action consistency loss. So great. So we have more or less just separated here two subspaces and two specific loss functions. Now, if you want to see this here in the original paper, they have a real nice, so I just have here a screenshot, so they're beautiful, so we linearize here the trajectory, also in a flattened form with the segment markers, reason and action. And then we have here for the distillation, we just have a reasoning mask, and guess what? It's one if the token belongs to the reasoning span, <laughs> otherwise, and for the action mask, it's one if the token belongs to the action span, otherwise, it's zero. What a surprise. And then we just have the COT policy alignment loss with the Gruber Kleibler and the action consistently loss. And you say, wow, I'm surprised. And then, then comes something interesting. Because for this curriculum learning, I was really waiting for this. No? How do you want to hear switch between the trajectories complexity scoring mechanism? And they just introduce here three hyperparameter. I mean, this is, um, okay, I don't want to say it's the easiest thing if you don't know what to do, but okay, so we have here three artificial hyperparameter, alpha, beta, and gamma, where our alpha corresponds here to the length of the reasoning, beta to the length of the action segments, and then we have here an entropy with gamma that reflects here the teacher uncertainty. And now the weights alpha, beta, gamma balance now the relative contribution. <laughs> okay, so... Let's do this and let's say, beautiful, everything worked out. And now let's have an evaluation. How good is this? Yeah? And the authors tell us, hey, you know what? We evaluate this now on the task success rate, on the average reasoning length. Now, this is interesting because this was here, exactly my last video, where we also had, you know, remember the short control token and the thinking control token. Then the chain of thought match rate, the consistency between teacher and student. And then a latency. Okay, and the benchmark itself, so we benchmark Alpha World, Map Shop, and Hot Pot QA React style. Great. If you want to see a detailed explanation here of the definition of those parameters, here it is. But I'll say we go now and we have a look at the results. So here we are. Now let's look here at the last one when the teacher model is here, a llama model, a 13 billion free trainable parameter model. And here you have this one, two, three benchmarks. And here in this benchmark, you see now here from Alf, Web, and Hot, you see now the parameter, the task success, the reasoning length, the chain of thought matching, and the latency, as I told you. So let's have a look. So here's our teacher, beautiful. So we have, I don't know, 75. And then say, if we do now a Lama 7B and we do all the specific imitation learning from this teacher from 13B, the student, the 7B now comes close to the teacher. Teacher has 75 and the student has 68. Teacher has 71. The student has 61. And yes, you can see it. Especially the chain of thought matching quality. Of course, the teacher is defined per C as 100%. But I would say 77% is not that famous, 72%. Okay, and yeah, and I mean, their main argument is not about how close can the student become the teacher, but their main argument, hey, what about we take here a vanilla Llama 7B? We do not optimize it for imitation learning. Well, yes, of course. Then instead of 68, we only have a 64% performance here on Alf World, for example. But yeah, so they argue now, as you see here in boldface, that if you take only the Llama 7B and now compare to their Llama 7B distilled version, that it is better overall. Okay, beautiful. But maybe a little tiny bit of selective perspective here on this particular benchmark. Now, you know, always at the end, I'll give you the real conclusion by the orchestra's well, if the authors say, hey, we have a structured compression framework now for agents that segment here the teacher trajectory into reasoning and action spans, enabling here the student agents to better mimic the high-level reasoning of the bigger models with a low-level execution. 
that is cheaper, but not as bad as the base model. Scaling ablation studies highlight the value of this structured supervision under limited capacity. Okay. You know what? Let's do a summary. Let's have some reflection on this. So I think it's great that we have now a model compression, not only on LLMs, that we quantize LLMs, that we prune LLMs, that we have uh, teacher-student LLM imitation learning. But now we do this with the more complex structure with agents, where we have the core is the LLM, but we have memory, we have learned tool use, we have learned other protocols, your communication protocols. So now we compress here the higher complexity of an agent. And I think this is great. And okay, if they tell us we have here to think about a structure agnostic distillation and how to solve this, great. So the teacher model has now a chain of thought reasoning trajectory and a separated action trajectory for tool calls, API or environmental actions. And then the, start, the student model just receives both trajectory and this is the supervision signal, and now the student tries to mimic as closely as possible with its smaller uh, transformer size, with its smaller network, trying to achieve the same level of complexity in the solution space. And as I told you, yes, we have here the reasoning tag here with the chain of thought policy alignment laws and the actions have spanned with the action consistency laws and beautiful. This is rather simple. But you know what? What I find interesting is, hey, what is it exactly, this methodology? No? Is it more to the supervised fine-tuning, like you have imitation? Or is it more because we're working here with the coolback lava divergence here? Do we learn policies or is it just here a shift in the probability distribution? What do you think? Now, here's my, my idea, my answer, and maybe I'm not correct. I just want to share this with you. So I think sad, <laughs> what a beautiful word, sad here is a form of imitation learning. I think we can agree on this. Yeah? So it kind of bridges here supervised learning and reinforcement learning because the goal is to learn a policy from an expert demonstration. Yeah? And I think best behavior is behavioral cloning here. It's the simplest form of imitation learning and it's essential supervised fine-tuning on what we know in the state action pairs. Now, I think that is real close to this behavioral cloning, closer to BC than to RL, because it's BC enhanced with the knowledge distillation. So what is that? I thought about it. I don't know if you agree. I think it's a supervised fine-tuning using knowledge distillation to perform behavioral cloning on a teacher agent's reasoning and separated action trajectory sequence. It does leverage here the policy terminology, terminology because it's dealing with decision-making sequences, and we have a kubik lava divergence here, but this is a tool from the knowledge distillation to have a better mimicry. So I would argue it's not a classical traditional reinforcement learning, because the student learns offline here from the teacher without a direct environment interaction or any reward signal in its own training loop. So supervision is defined by the teacher output, and this is it. Now, theoretically, you could argue, but this is also kind of environment to the student, well, and you know. What I find interesting is there were some pieces not addressed in this study by Harvard, MIT, and CMU, and I'm a little bit disappointed because I'm sad that this model is called sad. Paper does not give us further information on this particular hyperparameter of these alpha, beta, and gamma weights. It does not discuss how the weights were chosen, their sensitivity, ablation study for the curriculum learning component itself. There is something missing on this. How sensitive is the complete model behavior? Né? It is not specified if we go out of distribution here from the training data, how good would that generalize to unseen data? If it's required to do some reasoning on some action pattern sequence generation, that is real different from those of the teacher's training trajectories. What if we increase the complexity? When will it break? How will it break? Do we see some segments? And yeah, you get it, yeah? If we increase here the complexity, countermeasure would be to further divide it in simpler sub-goals. But how is this, if you want complexity, decomposition with sub-goals, 
doing here with our multi-loss optimization structure. If we go down on sub-goals and sub-sub-goals and I think at the third or fourth level, if we really go with specific loss function that we have to learn, we lose some of the coherence of the overall answer. So how would you deal with this? How would you involve, identify, supervising these deeper structural elements? No real answer to this. No? And then if you really want to go small, if you really want to go here at first cheaper, but also if you have not such a good computer infrastructure, maybe you have just a consumer GPU, how can we further compress those agents now? Because up until now, we quantized here LLMs. No? But if we can have now an agent compress, compress further, maybe we add some quantization or we add some pruning ideas so we can even make it even smaller no? for an efficient deployment, especially on embedded edge devices. So there are a lot of questions open, but the main methodology, if you are a subscriber of my channel, you see that in the last days, this was also implemented already and published here from our friends in China. So it was not such a great surprise. It was not such a great new idea. It followed here the recommendation of the other papers that were published already weeks and months ago. So I would say, yeah, it's a nice iteration and iterative development and iterative innovation. Another little tiny step forward. And... Yeah, maybe I would have expected here from the triumvirate here of MIT, Harvard and CMU, I was full of hope that I said, oh yes, now comes something absolutely fascinating that will here just be amazing in its complexity. And then, yes, then we have this publication. Yeah. You see, I just here, last video I focused here on two papers and I thought it's okay if I just focus here on one paper to make it easy. But yeah, a little bit disappointed here by the quality of Harvard and MIT. Anyway, interesting idea. Bring the size now of agent down, make it cheaper, make it smaller that we have. We can employ it really now also on non-dedicated hardware infrastructure for AI. So side effect, we can now employ AI systems here almost everywhere. And this might have consequences for the human workforce but more about this in one of my later videos. If you subscribe, I see you then.